invite you to stand this morning. Let's open our hearts. Let's prepare to worship our God this morning. Jesus, we are here. We're here for you. We've gathered in this place to honor you. To worship you in spirit and in truth. Oh, Jesus, we are here. We're here for you. the song inside. Oh, let us rejoice and let us magnify His name. Who wants to magnify the name of Jesus Christ this morning? Amen? Sing, Jesus, we are here. We're here for you. We're gathered in this place to honor you. Worship you in spirit and in truth. Oh, Jesus, we are here. We're here for you. so grateful for the opportunity to gather in this place to worship. Jesus, we love you and we thank you for all that you've done and for the gift of your spirit today. We've come here today to worship you, not just with our lips, but with our hearts. We've come here today as full participants, not as observers. And we just welcome your presence here with us today. May, uh, may our hearts be open to receive all that you have for us. And, and our prayer is that you would receive our worship today, that it would be a blessing to your heart. We pray this in your name, Lord Jesus, amen, amen. Well, welcome, good to have you at Crossroads Church this morning. Those of you that are here, those of you that are joining us online, why don't you take a minute and uh, greet those around you? It's kind of our custom to do that. And uh, then we'll continue to worship in song. Oh my soul, oh my soul 
Don't give up, there is hope, there is always hope. And there is peace in the storm, in the storm. No, don't forget, He is Lord, He is Lord of all. There is a King of glory, there is a God who saves, one who is strong and mighty, freedom is in His name. Open the gates of heaven, lift up a shout of praise, there is a lion roaring, Jesus the King of glory. So lift your eyes, stand in awe, stand in awe. At the sound of just one name Over all Jesus reigns I know, I know Nations bow, mountains shake Philippians uh, chapter 2, verses 5 to 11, we read this. It's, it's pretty familiar. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who existing in the form of God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name above all names, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen? Amen. And if you curse me, then I will bless you. And if you hurt me, I will forgive. And if you hate me, then I will love you. I choose the Jesus way. And if you're helpless, 
I will defend you And if you're burdened I'll share the weight And if you're hopeless Then let me show you There's hope in the Jesus way. I follow Jesus I follow Jesus He wore my sin I gladly wear His name He is the treasure He is the answer Oh, I choose the Jesus way If you strike me I will embrace you And if you pray me I'll sing his praise And if you kill me My home is heaven For I choose the Jesus way Jesus way.
Lord, moments ago, this auditorium was empty, but Lord, we filled it and we joined with the angels in heaven singing, holy, holy, holy. So Lord, may your presence fill us as you would have in our praises. God, may we sit here, Lord, and hear and listen and learn what the Spirit would say to us today and change us forever, Lord. We ask in Jesus' name. Good morning. It's good to see you all here. It is good for us to get together, lift high the name of our holy Lord together in the house of the Lord. So we're glad that you are worshiping with us here this Sunday. I have been loving this spring weather. I know, me too, but it's leaving us apparently this coming week, but we will enjoy today while we have it. And so I've started to think about spring, I've started to think about summer, and we actually have a couple camps here this morning with us. I saw Silversides out there, I saw River's Edge. So we have representatives from those camps who would love to chat with you after this service. If you have kids who would be interested in attending camp this summer or grandkids, make sure you go chat with them out in the cafe after this service. You know, next Sunday is the start of what we call Holy Week, the week that leads us to Good Friday and Easter Sunday, those events that are really the foundational things that have happened in our faith. And so we have a lot coming up here at the church because we want to take time to remember and celebrate Holy Week together. Our kids' ministry has lots going on over Holy Week, so make sure you check out their schedule. We are going to be doing something called the God Story Worship Night together on Tuesday, March 26, here in the sanctuary at 7 p.m. We did this for the first time last year, and I'm so, so excited that we get to do it again. We're going to walk through the whole of the biblical narrative together, but we're going to do it in a really, really beautiful way through song and worship and word and scripture. And I think as we leave that evening, we will just be amazed at what our God has done. So I want to invite all of you to come for that event. I also would encourage you to invite someone to come along with you. Maybe you know someone who who doesn't know God's story or who needs to be reintroduced to who God is and what he's done. It would be a great thing to invite them to come with you that night. We also, that week, have two Passover seders. And what you do at a Passover seder is it's a meal where we kind of walk through the events of the Exodus because that's what Jesus was doing that last week of his life. And when we talk about the Last Supper of Jesus, he was, he was at a Passover and, and he used elements from that meal to introduce us to communion and, and the way he wanted us to remember him. So we're having two of those events. The Wednesday night one on the 27th is for families with young Younger kids, so you'd be welcome to register for that. Bring your young kids with you. We'll have a great time together talking through the Exodus and eating good food. And then the Thursday night, the 28th, is our, it's a little bit schmancier, and we'll have a, a Alberta beef dinner, and we'll get together and walk through the Passover together. So you can register for both of those online. And then we would invite you to come back on the 29th, which is Good Friday. We will have services here in the sanctuary at 9 and 11 as we remember the crucifixion of Christ together. When you came in today, you may have got an invite for Easter Sunday. One side's Easter Sunday, the other side's God's story. Bring that home with you. There's more out in in the hub if you want to grab invites to give to people because we'd love for everyone to be back Easter Sunday, March 31st at 9, 11, or 6 as we celebrate together that Jesus is risen. So lots going on. Check out your bulletin online or in your hand and, and, and join us for those Holy Week events. I'm going to invite our our hospitality team to come forward, and I'm going to take just a minute to pray over our tithes and our offerings. Father, we do. We thank you for the chance that we have to be here together, worshiping you, recognizing what Jesus has done for us, and, and just being thankful for that, Lord. We are grateful for all that you have done for us. And we recognize that all we have is a gift from you. And so now we give back a portion of that to be used to to further the spread of the good news, the news about what Jesus has done here in central Alberta and all over the world. And as we continue in worship today, through hearing your word, through singing, we pray, Jesus, that you would speak to our hearts, that you would teach us what you want us to know so that we can go out into our weeks following you better, Lord, as we love you and as we love those around us. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.
As for me and my house, we will serve you, Lord, lifting holy hands in worship. We will not bow down to the gods of man. We will worship the God of Israel. For you are holy. Well, if you're just joining us today and haven't been here the last couple of weeks, we're in a series on the three temptations of Jesus when he was fasting for 40 days in the desert. And we've, we've talked a little bit in this series about how the word for temptation and the word for test are, are interchangeable. In other words, every situation that we're presented with is is two sides of the same coin. It can either be a test that that reinforces and strengthens us, or it can be a temptation that we fall to. And we've looked at the first temptation where Jesus is tempted to turn stones into bread to satisfy his hunger. And and we've looked at the second temptation where, where Jesus is tempted to use his spiritual power to wow people by throwing himself off the temple and God will rescue him dramatically. And Jesus passes both of these tests. And then we look today at the the final temptation in Matthew chapter four. And I'll read the words here for us in verses eight to 10. If you have your Bibles, you can turn there with us. It says, again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you'll bow down and worship me. And Jesus said to him, away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And growing up, I grew up in a Christian home and I kind of struggled with making sense out of this particular temptation. Because I I understood the stones into bread I understood hunger, right? No brainer, got it. And I grew up in a ministry home and and I understood the second temptation to wow people with how 
spiritual I was, and I knew all the Bible verses and all the Sunday school answers, and I got that one. But devil worship wasn't something I felt this particularly strong pull towards. I mean, I didn't know any devil worshipers, but I'd seen pictures, and I had a hard time imagining how this master scheming devil, you know, thought that maybe he could bring Jesus a black cape and get him some pagan symbols tattooed on his hands, and and all of a sudden Jesus is just going to start some devil worship. No, it didn't seem like a particular strong temptation for Jesus. Thank you, but I'll pass. But the way Matthew writes this temptation is he's actually showing us that the temptations get stronger, more difficult. The first one is in the desert. The second one is at the peak of the temple. And now here, he's at the highest mountain looking out over the whole earth. It's the ultimate temptation. And here, the devil, he, he takes a slightly different tactic than what he's been doing in the past. And, and we'll give a little background for those of you who haven't been with us. What we've talked about these last couple of weeks is that right before Jesus goes into the desert to be tempted, he's had his baptism. And at his baptism, God has spoken his identity over him. And there's two key components that get spoken at his, at his baptism. The first is that he's the beloved son. The son is the Messiah. The son is the chosen one by God who's prophesied to come and and rule the nations. Psalm 2 describes it in this way. It says, you are my son. Today I've become your father. Ask me and I will make the nations your inheritance. The ends of the earth your possession. You'll break them with a rod of iron, you'll dash them to pieces like pottery. It's pretty strong language about who this son is going to be, this ruler. And to understand how the Israelites saw this identity, we have to know a bit about their context. Because for 600 years, the Israelites have been an oppressed people. First, it's the Babylonians. And then it's the Persians, and then the Greeks, and then the Seleucids, and then now they're being oppressed by the Romans. And every single one of them has been this crazed, power-hungry military leader that oppresses them. And from the Bible, we know about some of these leaders. We know about one of the Persian leaders named Xerxes, and we, we... We kind of popularized him as this romantic hero with Esther. And yet if you look at the historical accounts about who he was, he's this violent, wild man. There's a story about him where he's at a, trying to have a battle and the sea isn't cooperating with him. And so he decides he's going to punish the sea and he has his army whip the sea with chains 300 times. Probably doesn't, you know, damage the sea too much. But if that's what he does to the sea, it gives you a taste of what he does to the people he doesn't really care about. And as the various rulers come into power over the years, they, um, they try desperately to oppress this hope that the Jews have that a son's going to come. And over time, public crucifixion becomes the way that these rulers try and force the Jews to fall in line, to quench this hope. And sometimes there was as many as 800 men crucified at a time, all in one area. And typically at some of these crucifixions at this time, what they would do is they would would kill the man's wife and children in front of him while he's helpless on the cross. This was 600 years of their oppression and they're hungry for the sun to come and break these nations with a rod of iron. 
That's what John the Baptist is hungry for. John is the one who baptizes Jesus, and and that's what he's waiting for. He said, Jesus is going to be the one who ushers in God's kingdom. He's the one. And then John gets on about helping challenge the authorities. You might know it winds him up in prison. And while John's in prison, he looks at Jesus' life and he, he's a bit confused. And he sends this message to Jesus and he says, are you, are you the son? Are you the one we're waiting for? Because you don't really seem like you're doing a lot of dashing like pieces of pottery. How, how are you going to rule, Jesus? And Jesus responds back to John, and he says something interesting. He says this. He says, tell John the blind see and the lame walk. The blind see and the lame walk. And those of us, if we've been in church much, we think the Sunday school answer, oh, that's what Jesus does. But that's not what the son was expected to do. No one expected that of the son. And Jesus is instead reminding John of the other word that was spoken at the baptism. John was there. The second part of Jesus' identity that was spoken wasn't about his rulership, wasn't about God's plan for him. It was about God's path for him. And it's a difficult word. In whom I am well pleased are the words, and it's a quotation that comes from a really difficult place in Scripture. They're called the servant songs, and there's four of them found in Isaiah. Pastor Dan mentioned this last week. And I won't put them on the screen for us here, but if you looked at them later this week, if you looked at these verses, you'd see they're not about ruling at all. They're about suffering. This is the figure that is said, opens blind eyes. No Israelite was expecting someone was going to come and actually open physical blind eyes. They thought that this figure, because people saw the absolute injustice of their life, maybe people would be turned to truth and have their eyes opened. Isaiah 53, I'll read some of the words for us. It says this about this figure. He was oppressed and treated harshly, yet he never said a word. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep is silent before the shears, he did not open his mouth. Unjustly condemned, he was led away. No one cared that he died without descendants, that his life was cut short in midstream. And as the Israelites thought about these passages, they said, yeah, we get that. Unjustly condemned, yep, that's been our story. Led like a lamb to the slaughter? Yep, that's us. Six, eight hundred crosses a day? We know this path. And they aren't interested in any path that involves suffering. They want the sun to rule. And the devil comes and says, why not? Have your identity, Jesus. Do it. Accomplish God's plan. You can have it all and just take a slightly easier path. It could be the son and not the servant. And this first great temptation is the lie that we can accomplish what God's promised in an easier, less painful, faster way by avoiding his path by just a little compromise. I thought about when I was a kid, and when I was a kid, my mom, well, we had to make our bed. It's usually what you have to do. We had to make our bed, and the only problem was my bed was a bunk bed. You know, these bunk beds are terrible. They, They just don't make properly. And I used to whine and complain, and it seemed like it took me forever. Now that I'm a parent, it probably took me maybe two minutes. But, but I found that if I just ripped out that top sheet and balled it up and threw it under my pillow, I could get the same result in about 35 seconds tops. Okay? 
win-win, right? My mom's happy with my made bed. I'm happy with 35 seconds. And I did understand that my mom would have preferred the sheet be inside the bed. I knew that. But with one little adjustment, we could both have our way. As I'm an adult now, I realize that the trouble is that my mom had a higher plan than just a made bed, right? Her goal is that in the process of bed making, I would become formed into a disciplined person. And instead, daily, for years actually, I formed myself in the opposite direction, into a deceptive person. I thought I had the same goal, and yet I went in the opposite direction. That's compromise. And it isn't a new temptation. It's where temptation starts. In the Garden of Eden, same temptation. Temptation in the Garden of Eden isn't that Adam and Eve are tempted to become like God. They're supposed to become like God. That's the plan. They're made in God's image. But the pathway to becoming like God is through a garden-style discipleship process. Garden is a hands-on place. You got to get your hands dirty, right? A bunch of us are itching to get our hands dirty soon in the garden. That's why they call it a kindergarten. It's from the German, kids' garden. Because the important thing isn't just getting math into your head. It's the process. It's formation. It's discipleship. And in this garden God's made, he has a certain pathway set out for Adam and Eve to be formed to become like him. You know what it is? He comes and he walks with them. And he talks with them every day. And in listening and obeying his way, they'll become like him. In other words, God's path is the plan. It is the plan. They can't be separated. And here on the mountain and in the Garden of Eden, the devil tries to separate them. You can still become like God, just use an easier path. And Jesus on the mountain has this emotional reaction to the devil's temptation. You know, in the other two, Jesus kind of gives this very rabbi-like response. He says, you know, it is written, you know, very formal. Here, he just, he emotionally reacts and he says, away from me, Satan. Why does he react? Because this is the test of our worship. And our eternity is won or lost based on our worship. That's why the devil's after it. And he's not afraid to admit it. What do we really worship? See, the enemy knows that what we worship is going to determine our path. It determines our decision-making. Worship isn't about capes and bowing down or even about singing. Augustine says it's about our love. Because what we ultimately love is what frames our decision-making. And over time, one decision after another, we become like what we love. We can look back at people in history and think about, you know, what they loved in order to get where they got. You can think of Cleopatra or Hitler or Mother Teresa. And they, they don't end up on these different trajectories because of their genetics. It's because of a life of decisions, yes and no, based on what they loved most. 
what has their heart, their worship. And the tricky thing for us is that it doesn't matter what we say we worship. It doesn't matter what we think we worship. You notice in the passage, the devil doesn't ask Jesus to stop worshiping God. Because when push comes to shove, what matters is what ultimately shapes our decision-making. We make a lot of decisions in a day. And usually our decisions aren't about these kingdoms and powers. It's about the kingdom and power of our own happiness. Happiness is king where we live. That's our culture. We're shaped by our culture. How much of your decision-making is based on your own happiness? And some of you right away are saying, no, not me. I'm, I'm a sucker for punishment. All I do is work. Now, if I loved happiness, I'd be taking a lot more vacations or watching a lot more TV and eating more chips. Maybe. Unless you're the sort of person who finds happiness in achievement or perfectionism or outworking those around you, right? The reason so many of us struggle to keep the Sabbath commandment where God asks us to rest for one day out of seven, we don't struggle with it because we're starving to death and we have to work. We struggle because even though we know it is part of God's path for us to be formed like him, just going to get a few things done today because getting stuff done makes us happy. Where we live, because we're such a blessed people where we live, we don't often actually have to choose between our happiness and God's path. Often they, they actually go together. I was thinking about this in this season because, you know, one of the things God tells us is he tells us to tithe. He tells us, as we follow him, to give 10% at least of our money to the Lord. And I, you don't know this about me, but I'm not a particularly generous person by nature. It's not my, you know, greatest desire to, to give money away. And, and, and it isn't because I love vacations or love getting the latest throw cushions for the season or that sort of thing. It's because I'm cheap. And, and I love having a nest egg. That makes me happy. God says tithe. But where we live, there's a particular season of the year where I can follow God's path and I get a tax break. Win-win. Right? beautiful. There's so much of this where we live. God asked me to go to church. I prefer to sleep in. I prefer to stay home. I can watch church at home on my couch. Makes me happy. Or if I don't, you know, if the speaker of the day is not doing it for me, I can tune someone else in that makes me happy. And the challenge for us in this place of privilege and blessing that we live is actually because the places of blessing where my path and God's path line up, my happiness and his way, these are the greatest points of our temptation. And we've got a lot of them. This is what Jesus is on to in this passage. It's why he quotes from where he quotes in Deuteronomy in his response. He says, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. I want to read the context that he gives that passage in Deuteronomy. It's Deuteronomy chapter 6, starting at verse 10. I'll read the words for us. God's talking to the Israelites and he says, when the Lord your God brings you into the land, he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give you a land with large flourishing cities you did not build, Houses filled with all kinds of good things you did not provide, wells you did not dig, and vineyards and olive groves you did not plant. 
when you eat and are satisfied, be careful that you do not forget the Lord who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. That word serve doesn't mean serve like do a bunch of things. It means obey. Obey him. Jesus quotes this passage because it's in the places of blessing, the places where our happiness lines up with God's path. They're the most dangerous pitfalls for us because when our path is lined up, it's really difficult to see which one I love most until a test comes. And they come for all of us. If you're not experiencing a particular test right now, You will. Soon, maybe. Test. Temptation. The Bible sometimes has another word for it. Calls it trials. And a few months ago, I had a situation pop up in my life that um, was unfair and seemed complicated to me and was really uncomfortable. And I I knew I needed to make a decision about it. And I stewed about it and I thought about all of the different possibilities of plans and paths and, and I complained about it a little bit, but I was careful not to pray about it for a good week because I did not want to hear God maybe say to me, I need to do the one thing I did not want to do. I didn't want to hear that word. And when I finally took some time with the Lord on it, I felt in his gentle whisper, I felt him just just say this to me, Julie, do you trust me? It's not a fair question. What are you supposed to say? Of course I trust you, God. It's this, it's this path that I don't trust so much. It says, worship the Lord your God, serve him, obey him only, because trust is not something that we say. Trust is forged one act of obedience at a time. And as I was wrestling with the situation in my life, Um, I heard a a song came on, and it's a song that we sing here. Sometimes you might recognize the words of it. It's a good song. But the phrase caught me, and I reacted to it. The phrase says this, trials look like gifts of grace when I look to Jesus. The song's talking about God will work things for our good. But the phrase, something inside me said, Not always. Because sometimes when we look to Jesus, we get handed a path that does not look like a gift of grace. It looks like a cross. You know, we've popularized crosses, right? We've made them part of our jewelry and you can wear a chain around your neck with a cross or, or... bedazzle your belly button with the cross or what have you, but, but crosses have one purpose, deaths. Deaths. Death of dreams, death of opportunities, death of health, independence, death of happiness. And sometimes we're looking at Jesus And yet we're stuck in an unhappy marriage. And we say, would God really ask me to walk this path? Or sometimes God's path and our our sexual happiness don't line up. And we think, would God really ask me to be single, to be celibate forever? That can't be realistic for today. Can't apply. Or the path for our career happiness or our success is blocked by an aging loved one that we have to care for. Or our children, and they take all of our time. And people 
you tell us we should enjoy it, but maybe we don't. Pain or sickness, and it seems unfair. We trust God. It's the path that seems unnecessary. And it's easy for us to compromise our theology or compromise on our vows or compromise on our attitude and we can get bitter. We compromise on our view of the Bible. It doesn't have authority in all things for us today. Or sometimes, like me, we, we compromise on our time with the Lord. That same path he gave to Adam and Eve to walk with him and talk with him daily, be formed in his image. You know, we've called this series, It Is Written, because for three weeks in a row, we, we've emphasized that if we're going to be a church that stands in the face of tests and trials, temptations, we have to, have to be attentive to his word. We've got to be in the word. We've got to get to church where the word is spoken. And sometimes people say things like, oh, I don't get much out of the Bible. And when it comes to decision-making, I, I go to my trusted Christian friends. They help me make my decisions or those closest to me. And that's really great for things like picking out glasses where you need, you know, which ones? Help me. Send out the photos to everyone, right? But when you're faced with pain and unfairness and a path that is not going to be of your liking, sometimes our Christian friends do exactly what Peter did. When Jesus tells Peter and says, Peter, I'm going to have to suffer. And Peter says, no. God wouldn't ask that of you. Because Peter's shaped by his happiness. And all of us are shaped by our happiness. We've all given in to other loves. We've all been formed in a way where we've chosen to compromise. Many of us this week. And as we're formed by these things, they disqualify us from becoming like God. In the book of Revelation, John, the disciple of Jesus, he has this vision. He has this vision of God seated on a throne. And, and God has, has written a perfect plan for each of us on a scroll. And it's sealed up in this scroll. And it's sitting there. But in order to come into be, it has to be opened. And to open the scroll requires that someone will walk the path of obedient trust. And John looks around. And he looks. He looks at everyone's choices. And he cries. And he weeps. Because we all love other things. And then he hears a loud shout. And says, look, the Lion of Judah. The son, the ruler. He's here. And John turns and he looks. And instead of seeing a lion, this powerful figure, he looks. And there's just a, a bleeding, broken lamb. a suffering servant. The one who was obedient to death, even death on a cross. And that very thing that seemed like an unnecessary path was the greatest moment in victory in all of history. And as John, his vision keeps going and the scroll bursts open and the plan gets carried forth in a loud voice, it is declared the kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ and he shall reign forever and ever. And today, at the center of the universe, there's a lamb who reigns. And all of us are faced with a decision of will I worship him? 
Well, I worship him. Not just with my lips, not just with my songs. Will I worship him in obedient trust, no matter what the path is that I'm facing? And maybe, maybe as you're here today, maybe you have something in your life that you know is not in line with God's path. And you've been holding on to it and allowing it to form you. Maybe you know there is something today that you actually need to bring to the foot of the cross of Christ and say, God, would you help me to worship you and be formed by you, not this other thing. Maybe for probably most of us, it's just everyday situations. The things that stress us out, the things that occupy our mind, things we're not quite sure how to work out in our life. And today, I think what this passage asks of us is is just to hold it before the Lord and say, Lord, would you keep me from being compromised by the desire to walk in the path of my own happiness? Help me to trust you whatever your path may be, to walk in obedience. We're going to have the worship team come out and they're going to sing a song. And and as we sing it, this song, let's allow the words that we sing to align with our, our offering of our days and weeks to the Lord in obedient trust. Let me pray for us. Thank you, Lord, that you are so not like us. And yet you say we can walk your way. Thank you, Lord, that Jesus showed us the way. Today we ask by your Holy Spirit, would you give us the courage to accept your path? In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Stand with us as we sing.
Well, we have time today. We don't have to rush off. And, um, you know, some of you, some of you have difficult paths in front of you this week. And if you have something in your life that is difficult, you are welcome to come and pray. There are people at the front who would love to pray with you and pray that God would help you to be formed by Jesus Christ and in his way, instead of being pulled off in the difficulty of trying to find a happy path. If you've got something you need to, to lay down today, take some time. And maybe there's, maybe there's someone here and maybe you don't know much about God's plan. But maybe you know that walking in the path of your own happiness is not giving you peace. You could come today and for the first time be introduced to Jesus. And you could accept his cross and he would give you his Holy Spirit to walk with you and talk with you and follow in his way. You could come today. So as we close our time, I'm gonna just share the words of Romans 15, verse 13 over us. It says, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him. Then you will overflow with confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. May that be true of us this week. Amen. my desire to honor you Lord with all my heart I give you
See you.